Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be with you during UNL's International Education Week. My name is Marin Hansen. I am Curator of International Collections at the International Quilt Museum. We thought it would be a great way to tie into International Education Week by talking about cloth and culture, quilted objects from around the world. So here are the three main topics I'll be talking about today. What are quilts? Um, maybe you know, maybe you don't know. I'll just give you a little overview of what they are exactly and what we can learn from them. And then the primary part of what I'll be talking about today is showing you some quilts from around the world that are in our collection. And then I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about who we are as an institution, as a part of the University of Nebraska, what we do, and um, maybe perhaps how you could get involved as well. Let's get started. So what are quilts? Now you might have uh, some ideas already in mind and a lot of people when they think of quilts, uh, there are sort of some stereotypical ideas or images that they have. For instance, uh, a lot of times we think that quilts only exist in the past. You know, there's a, here's this uh, painting of an older lady working on a quilt uh, sometime in the past. We don't know exactly when, but you know, this is sort of a stereotypical view that some people might have of quilt making. Now, this is not so far in the past, you know, probably mid 20th century or getting on into the 1970s, perhaps, judging by some polyester fabrics I'm seeing. But again, this sort of fits into stereotypes that we might have or just some generalized ideas about quilt making, that it's older women, uh, that it's predominantly white women, and that perhaps they work in groups like this, uh, what sometime is, sometimes is called a quilting bee. Um, so these are ideas, again, that have predominated about quilts. And so there are, there are some kernels of truth to that. Certainly, um, it is often um, older or middle-aged women who practice quilt making, at least today it is. And partly that just has to do with leisure time, expendable income. A lot of times younger people don't have the time or the ex extra funds to participate in a hobby like quilt making. So, so even today, some of those stereotypes can ring a little bit true. Now, uh, but there are other things about quilts that also are true and that, you, that are perhaps less well known. And those are things like craftsmanship, communication, protest, art. Um, so craftsmanship certainly plays into quilt making. Uh, this piece is from the Austro-Hungarian Empire from the 19th century, and it looks almost like a drawing or a, a, like a, a, yeah, a draftsman's drawing of buildings or maybe a painting, but those are actually all woolen fabrics that have been sewn together, uh, sort of like in an inlay technique. If you're familiar with woodworking, there are inlay techniques where you actually cut the piece precisely to shape and then fit them together like a jigsaw puzzle. So craftsmanship absolutely plays a part in quilt making and technique and becoming really, really good at what you do. So that's, that's something that um, I think maybe people don't think about. They just think about, well, oh, you sew a quilt together, but they maybe are less familiar with just how precise and how skilled you sometimes need to be to make a quilt. In terms of communication, um, quilts can be a, a absolutely powerful form of communication. This is a photograph of the AIDS quilt on the Washington Mall. The, the AIDS quilt obviously was not just a single quilt. It was uh, thousands of panels commemorating the deaths of people from AIDS. And this began as a way to both, yes, commemorate the loss, uh, the tragedy of, of losing those lives, but also as a way to communicate to the United States citizens, but also politicians, that this was something uh, that needed to be addressed. So it was a really powerful tool for communication. Quilts have also been used as protest. This is a quilt made by an artist named Jean Ray Laurie. And uh, she was, along with many other people, feminists in particular, was just appalled uh, in the 1970s, I believe it was, there was a, a senator, Paul Van Dalsum, who actually said these words, 
once upon a time, there was a senator from Arkansas. In a famous speech, he said, and so here's the direct quotation, I'll tell you what we do up here in Perry County when one of our women starts poking around in something she doesn't know anything about. We get her an extra milk cow. If that don't work, we give her a little more garden to tend. And if that's not enough, we get her pregnant and keep her barefoot. So uh, Jean Ray Laurie obviously is protesting and, and I'm kind of poking fun a little bit at this sort of backwards attitude, this very sexist attitude that a, uh, an elected official had stated and she wanted to um, yeah, protest against that sentiment. Now quilts can also just be beautiful artwork. Michael James made this piece in the 1980s and um, it's just beautifully designed. It uh, fits into the form that he was working in at the time, which was these strip pieced or just like stripes of fabrics fitting them together. And he, yeah, this is what he became known for in the 1980s in the end into the 1990s. And some of you may know that he is a professor emeritus at UNL. And so quilts can absolutely be a form of expression. And many trained artists have chosen quilts as their, their medium. And finally, a lot of people think of quilts as simply being American. I mean, that is not the case. This is a piece from uh, Southwest China. Quilts can be found in many, many places all over the world. And that is what I want to uh, be able to share with you today. But first, let's keep talking a little bit about what are quilts. And so you, we need to understand some techniques in order to know exactly how to define a quilt. Now, technically, a quilt is a three layered textile. So here's a shot that shows you those three different layers. The layers consist of a, a, a backing fabric, which is usually plain. Here, it's just a white fabric. That's that bottom layer. There's a middle layer, which is often um, what's called batting. And it's a um, sort of a, a loose uh, sheet of fibers, uh, often wool or cotton, that add uh, some dimension and also give warmth. And then the top layer is the decorative layer. And here it's a, a pieced or sewn together decorative nine patch top actually. And um, all three of those layers then are held together with quilting stitches. And quilting stitches are simply a running stitch. Um, you can see the quilting stitches on this detail very well. They are just those areas of texture that you see in, in sort of the background areas. They give extra dimension. And then, of course, as I said, they hold all of those layers together. Here's a shot of someone actually doing some hand quilting. And again, it's just that plain, simple running stitch up and down, up and down over over and under. Uh, although it does take lots and lots of practice if you want to get your quilting stitches nice and tiny. Now, piecing is another technique that is a, a vital part or a frequent part of quilt making. And piecing is simply uh, sewing fabrics together edge to edge. So that's what you see here. To create this uh, schoolhouse shape, the maker cut out fabrics and then sewed them um, edge to edge to make the shapes she wanted to create the chimneys, to create the window and the door. Um, so piecing is um, one of the two most frequently used techniques for making that decorative top portion of the quilt. Now, the other technique that is most common in making the decorative top of a quilt is what's called applique. And applique uh, is often used to create more curvilinear shapes like you see here. And that it, it's different from piecing in that the fabrics are not sewn edge to edge, but these are fabrics that are cut out and then laid on top of another fabric and sewn down along the edge of that cutout shape. So each of those flowers and leaves has a tiny little stitch holding it down. And if I zoom in, you can kind of see where there's darker areas, for instance, along this red flower. Those are all the applique stitches that are holding it down on top of the white background and on top of those leaves that are below it. 
on, you can also see the tiny little quilting stitches that this maker used uh, to hold all of those layers together. So those are just some of the techniques um, that you need to know about when you're starting to think about, well, what is a quilt? Another way to think about what is a quilt is to think about sort of uh, themes or, or areas where we can learn something from quilts. And some of those uh, areas that quilts can help give us insight to are things like history and certainly women's history uh, is, a, is an area where we can gain a lot of insight by looking at quilts, by examining them in detail or looking at their history or looking at the history of the makers. Technology is another area where you can uh, gain some knowledge uh, by looking at quilts, for instance, uh, thinking about um, the use of the sewing machine, which was actually invented in the 1840s, but didn't become common um, for people to be able to use or affordable until after the Civil War. Um, and so by examining quilts from those specific eras, you can start to see when uh, machine sewing starts to become more common you can start to sort of build up a timeline about the use of technology that also relates to things like printed fabrics, um, you know, when, when uh, different printing styles became, uh, were developed and then became more common. So technology is definitely an area that helps us um, learn more about quilts and vice versa. Quilts can help us learn more about them. Trade is definitely uh, an area that's related to quilts intimately. The, the East India companies that began in the, the 1600s, uh, the first large scale commercial visits to the Far East and to uh, places like India and uh, to Indonesia, those were all driven in large part by the desire to obtain uh, textiles from those parts of the world. Printed cottons were being imported from India and they were highly prized, highly coveted. And so lots of world trade was really sparked by textiles that did, many of which did end up um, being featured in quilts. So trade is an area, world cultures, it's such a great way to learn about different peoples from around the world by looking at their textiles, including quilts, um, design, Quilts are such a great way to think about design, um, to think about you know, dimensionality, how colors work together, how uh, the formats and things like value and shading and hue, how all of those formal elements of design, how they work together. You can really see that in many different quilt formats um, and, and styles. And finally, I thought I would bring up fashion uh, quilting and patchwork and applique all have come in and out of fashion in clothing over the years. And just this year, uh, we saw ASAP Rocky uh, at the Met Gala wearing a uh, quilt essentially around him. Uh, Rihanna did not choose to go the patchwork route, but this is sort of a puff quilt, which was a style not widely popular, but uh, definitely a, a format you see from time to time. And this was a, uh, a specially uh, made garment for him to wear to the gala. So uh, quilts become relevant in terms of fashion as well. So those are just some of the areas or some of the themes, thematic areas that um, relate to quilts or can help us learn more about quilts. So that gives you just a little introduction to what are quilts. Uh, so right now I will next dive into showing you some quilts from around the world. And all of these pieces will feature quilting or piecing, which is sometimes also called patchwork, or applique. Um, or sometimes it'll have all three, sometimes the piece will only have one of those, but those are the three areas of collecting that we focus on at the International Quilt Museum. And so I've divided the globe up a little bit, just sort of based on some of the, the selections that I've made to show you. Now, obviously this is not gonna be comprehensive. We have pieces from over 50 different countries in our collection, and uh, I can only show you a handful today. So let's um, take a look at Europe and the Middle East. 
And obviously there are large parts of this region that I can't touch on at this point. I've selected a, a handful of pieces, mostly from sort of the Eastern Mediterranean um, and eastward. So what's interesting about all these pieces is that they all have really elaborate quilting or that quilting is the main technique featured on them. So I'll start at this westernmost end of this Mediterranean region. This piece is from Calabria, Italy, and Calabria is actually sort of the toe of the boot of Italy. So it's it's surrounded by sea, the sea. Um, and this is an all quilted piece. We received it with a name attached to it, Fortunata Chimato, and she likely made it in the first couple decades of, of the 20th century. And as I zoom in here, you can see just how elaborate her quilting was. Now, she not only quilted it, but she also inserted extra stuffing in between all of those quilting stitches to give even further dimensionality to this piece. Now, it's an interesting piece. It shows lots of different imagery that would be relevant to people living in this part of Italy. Uh, as I said, it's surrounded by the sea. And so you can see that there are uh, seashells at the top and uh, bottom. I'm sort of using my mouse to point out one of those seashells. And then we've got, I'm trying to find, oh yes, the sheaves of wheat are in the corner. So wheat would of course have been grown in Italy and then used to make pasta, what we now know associate so closely with Italy. And then we also see grapes. And obviously we know that grapes are very, very much associated with Italy and winemaking. Now the central motif appears to be a, a mother pelican. And this is a, a imagery that is often associated with Christian belief. And the pelican, who doesn't have the large beak that we associate it generally with the, the pelican, but I believe this is a pelican, and she is feeding her two offspring with her own blood. And this is a this is common imagery in in Christian storytelling and Christian uh, artwork, I should say. And it obviously there's a connection to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ shedding his own blood to save humanity. So this is a, a very powerful image and uh, a, one that would definitely be associated with a, a heavily Catholic country like Italy. So we move a little, just a little further east to Albania, which is just across the sea. And here we have a, a really beautiful child's quilted jacket. It's got gold braid on it and some really highly decorated uh, buttons on it. But when you look at the lining on the inside, you can really appreciate how sort of stuffed and thick this quilted jacket is. So this probably would have been used for sort of holidays or, or special occasions. And then a little further east, we move to Greece. And this is a whole cloth quilt made in the mid 20th century. And um, this is a style that you see in Greece as well as in Turkey. Um, this whole cloth style, uh, often with uh, these sort of shiny fabrics, either a, a cotton sateen or a silk fabric. And again, they're, they're highly stuffed. And this endless knot is definitely a motif you see in, in Greek art, um, as well as uh, Italian art, uh, Roman especially, early, early art. And, um, but this is a 20th century piece, as I said, and it actually traveled to the United States with a family that was uh, immigrating. And they came to the US around 1950 and brought this quilt with them. And obviously they couldn't bring a lot of possessions with them when they left. So this was special enough that they wanted to uh, make sure it came to the new, uh, their new life in the US with them. Uh, as we move even further east, in, and we look at the area of the Eastern end of the Mediterranean uh, called the Levant. Um, so countries like today, Syria, Lebanon, um, what's now Israel and Palestine and 
where Jerusalem is, um, that's called the Levant. And uh, these robes, and I'll zoom in here for you. These robes are believed to have been made uh, in the late 19th century into the early 20th century and often were sold to tourists who were going, they were on their way from, usually from Europe, going to visit the Holy Land. And you see these in many museum collections around the world, actually. I actually saw one in a museum in Beijing, China. So uh, these have made their way all over and uh, are a sort of an early form of tourist textile is what we believe them to be. As we move further east into what is now called Iran, and uh, at the time when these objects were made, it would have still been called Persia. Uh, and this piece uh, that was probably made in Northwest Persia by Kurdish people is actually a, a form of re sort of recycling or upcycling perhaps. The center panel is a kilim, rug, which is a, a flat weave. Uh, it's a form of flat woven rug. And so whoever made this decided to take their um, beautiful kilim rug, add a border to it and quilt it and turn it into um, either a bed cover or perhaps it was used um, to sit on on the floor. So it's a very beautiful um, striped fabric in the middle that contrasts a great deal with this piece which is actually a prayer rug. And now this one is a lot more um, elaborate in terms of the stitching that was used to create it. There's very intricate uh, embroidery. Now embroidery is a decorative form of stitching where the, and that, and the embroidery usually just sits on the top layer of a fabric whereas quilting goes through all three layers. So you see both embroidery here, as well as quilting, all of these sort of shell-shaped motifs. Now that is quilting, so it goes all the way through the layers to hold them all together, but it also is decorative as well. And this piece, it has a mirab, uh, which, which is this shape at the top, uh, which uh, represents or is meant to look like uh, a prayer niche, a, a, an Islamic prayer niche. And so this prayer rug would be used uh, during, during the several times a day that a Muslim uh, prays. And here is the final piece that I'm gonna talk about from this area, and it's a beautiful cap. So it's not just um, flat textiles, that we see that have these techniques. We also see garments and accessories. And the, you can see the quilting there is quite fine. And the printed fabric there is of, this, of the type that Europeans really fell in love with and, and wanted to import and bring into um, places like France and, and England and incorporate into their own fashion and um, home textiles. So that was Europe and the Middle East for you. Very quick <laughs> overview. I'll next move on to Asia and the Pacific. I'm gonna go again from sort of west to east and we start to see some different techniques here. We see a lot more patchwork and applique. I'll start up in Uzbekistan. Here is a piece that uh, you can see there are hanging tabs at the top. In Central Asia generally, uh, pieces like this, which are, are usually made using patchwork or piecing, these are often used as a home decoration. And many um, groups of people in this part of the world uh, throughout Central Asia were nomadic and they would follow their herds, camels or goats, and they would move from place to place and they would bring their home with them, often called a, a yurt or a gur. And they would bring their um, decorations with them as well. So they had to be transportable and nothing's better than textiles in terms of easy transport. So an Uzbek person made this to decorate their home. And you can see the, just the dynamic use of color and pattern. This is very typical of Uzbek patchwork. Uh, a little further south down into Pakistan, we see uh, also a very vibrant uh, patchwork quilt. 
Uh, the Uzbek piece was not quilted. This one is, however, it is both pieced, applique, and quilted. So it shows all three of those techniques. Um, the patchwork or piecing is in the center. The applique you can see on some of the borders that go around, and then the quilting you can see um, as giving sort of dimensionality to this piece. Uh, and the maker of this, she call it's so these pieces are called Raleigh, Raleigh quilts. And she made it in a pattern that she called the Biso Bulo, or the nose jewel and nose ring pattern. So she made this in the, in the mid 1990s. A little further east into India and the part of India called Bengal, which is in the Eastern part of India. This is the style of quilt that they make there. And this is called Kanta. And this is interesting because uh, the quilting stitch, which goes through all the layers of fabric, it also serves as sort of an embroidery stitch. So she's using uh, the quilting stitch to create these beautiful images. Um, we see tigers and elephants, fishes, and we also see lots of um, peacocks. And in Indian sort of myth and legend, peacocks uh, are often the killers of snakes. They're brave and they kill the, the snakes that are, are threatening. So we just see lots of really beautiful um, imagery, very relevant to life in Bengal, uh, the Eastern part of India. Uh, as you move north up to Tibet, we see this uh, Buddhist temple hanging and it likely was made out of Chinese brocades Brocade is just a, is a fancy uh, woven fabric, silk usually. And in Tibet, in the temples there, the Tibetan Buddhist temples, people would, um, they would donate expensive fabrics to the temples to sort of you know, curry favor with the temple. And a lot of those were, as I said, Chinese brocades. And so they were sewn together to make these, um, temp uh, these temple hangings, maybe on the altar, something like that. Uh, further into China, uh, there are many ethnic groups in this part of China, South and Southwest China, that make applique and patchwork bed covers. So the piece on the left uh, is a, it's actually a quilt cover. It would go around a blanket or some filling um, and sort of like a European duvet. So it would have a top and a middle, but they wouldn't quilt all of those together. They would just stuff it, uh, this envelope, this cloth envelope, um, so that they could once a year or so take the stuffing out and wash everything and then restuff it. So this is a beautiful quilt cover, probably from the Maonan or Miao people. And then also in this part of China, you see quilting on the uppers or the, the upper cloth section of shoes and these are mud shoes they would have been used during you know rainy seasons and you can start to see the little metal studs that are all along the bottom of these leather soles that would help give traction in the mud but the quilting is is actually quite beautiful on these uh, uppers of these shoes further north in china we have this interesting waistcoat or vest um it's very it's it's in the Manchu style. So the Manchu people are a, a Northeast Asian ethnic group, and they were actually the rulers of the final dynasty in China, the Qing dynasty. And this piece has an interesting history, sort of a Hollywood history. It was actually acquired by a costume, an assistant costume designer for the movie, The Last Emperor from, I believe, 1987 or so. It was Bernardo Bertolucci's movie about the last emperor Puyi. Um, it wasn't, I don't think it was shown in the movie, but it was purchased by that uh, assistant costume designer, probably as sort of inspiration for some of the costuming they did and the beautiful quilting on there. You can see that those round shapes, those are um, the, the show symbol, uh, which is a, a, a indicator of longevity or a hope for long, longevity. As we go even further east, we look at some patchwork from Japan. And again, we have another garment here, a vest. And these are, this is a beautiful piece made of tiny, tiny little pieces of silk uh, crepe weave fabrics. And crepe weave just gives sort of a crinkly 
uh, look or, or feel to the fabrics. And so uh, the maker of this one took tiny, tiny little slivers of fabric and pieced them together uh, and made this beautiful garment. Patchwork and piecing in, in parts of Asia often are associated with Buddhism and asceticism or being frugal. Uh, the belief is that the patchwork shows that you are committed to sort of being frugal or, or um, living a, an austere lifestyle. So you see it somewhat frequently in China and Japan both. Now I'm going to go way down to the South Pacific now. <laughs> and I don't actually think my map, I think my map cut off before I reached where this piece is actually from, which is the Cook Islands in, in the South Pacific, sort of to the east of New Zealand. And this is a, an applique style um, from that part of the world, from the South Pacific. This is done in sort of that snowflake style that you might think of, where you fold something into quarters or maybe even eighths and then cut the edges and, and you then unfold it and get a really beautiful design. And that's exactly how they make these pieces in the South Pacific. So that was Asia. Uh, I have a few pieces to show you from the Americas. I'll maybe start down south in South America. This is a Bolivian piece illustrating uh, sort of rural life done with applique mainly, some, some piecing as well but it's just a very whimsical uh, glimpse of rural life in Bolivia with some llamas and cooking and fishing, uh, maybe some weaving down there at the bottom. So um, just a really nice slice of life piece made by a Bolivian artist. And here is a, a skirt made out of what's called Seminole patchwork. And that is the tiny little pieces you see there. That's what uh, is associated with um, patchwork made by the Seminole people or the Miccosukee um, people who are from Florida in the United States. So a lot of times um, these, this patchwork is made into garments um, and either worn by native people or sold um, to visitors or tourists to Florida. And finally, when we go way north <laughs> up to the Hudson Bay, to Nunavut in Canada, we have this piece made by a, an Inuit artist. Uh, her name was Eugenie Tatuni Kabluitak. Um, and she actually was uh, better known as a sculptor. So many of her sculpture pieces are in museums across Canada, but she also made these applique uh, felt pieces. And again, sort of like the Bolivian piece, it's just a, a wonderful slice of life uh, image showing uh, people at uh, just doing daily activities up in the, in the Nunavut Arctic regions, living in an igloo and there's sled dogs there, there's some ice fishing, um, some bear hunting, some walruses. So again, just a really wonderful use of applique uh, to, to create images and to tell a story. And applique really is the technique that um, is best suited to that, to telling those um, specific stories. Finally, we will hop to Africa. I've got, again, a beautiful applique piece by uh, a woman named Elizabeth Savanhu. She is from Zimbabwe, and she made this in the early 2000s. And she's, again, telling the story of village life here. She's got a couple, a man and a woman, um, and, and they're doing daily activities such as, you know, they even, they brew beer. Uh, they're taking a bath together near, down near the bottom. They're, um, two, of the, two women from the village go to fetch water. So it's just a really, uh, again, a, 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 daily, a view of daily life in Zimbabwe as created by this artist. Over in, Ghana, West Africa, uh, we have this piece made uh, by the, the Fante people, and it's an Asafo flag. The Asafo were sort of um, militia groups, uh, warrior groups, and they adopted the form of the European flag, but really kind of turned it into their own art form um, and uh, often put on imagery uh, that would specifically intimidate other Asafo or warrior groups. 
So um, it's an interesting, yeah, adoption of the uh, European flag format into a very much a, a Ghanaian look. And finally, we have a piece from Sudan that shows applique in a very simple format. And that's because this was the uniform of an officer uh, who, um, a Mahdist officer, and they, that was a group of people who were fighting um, the incursion of the British into Sudan. And they were a, a, a very Islamic uh, group and they wanted to li live a very simple, very uh, Islamic lifestyle. And so they, that's why they had just very simple patterns on their uh, uniforms. So this would have been an officer uh, of the Mahdist army. So that was just a very, very quick um, sort of trot across the globe. <laughs> and it, I wanted to show you how uh, quilting, applique, and, and piecing or patchwork are used by people just all over the world, either to you know, beautify their life or tell a story or just express themselves or keep warm. All of those things can be done with a quilt. So finally, in my last couple minutes here, I wanted to just tell you about us, the International Quilt Museum. Uh, if you are a newer student at UNL, you may, may or may not be aware of us. Um, we are located on East Campus, right at the sort of the doorway to East Campus at 33rd and Holdridge. And to give you just a little bit of a quick history, we were founded in 1997, and I have a photo here of um, our main benefactors, Robert and artist James. They donated their collection to us of around a thousand quilts. You can see here, um, this was where they stored the quilts uh, in a purpose-built, specially uh, air-conditioned and um, space where they kept all of their thousand quilts. Uh, but in, in 1997, they decided they wanted someone else to care for them and to continue their mission of building a global quilt collection. So they donated them to the University of Nebraska. Uh, we were located in the home economics building for about a decade. And then in 2008, we uh, got a new building. Again, the generosity of the, uh, of the James family helped, but the building also was, it was largely um, funded through private donations from many, many different people. So the, in 2008, we debuted this new building. Uh, it, it's a, it was a 37,000 square foot building, but then in 2015, we added another 13,000 square feet, which gave us a whole new gallery. Uh, we had three galleries, um, three smallish galleries in the original building, and then we were able to add one very large gallery, as well as some more storage space for all of our quilts. So that happened in 2015. And here is a f an image of our most recent exhibition that's on view right now, Modern Meets Modern. So if you head over to the International Quilt Museum, this is what you can see, some really beautiful antique and very, very modern quilts paired together. Um, so I'll also just tell you a little bit about what we do. We uh, research and care for our quilts. We document them. Um, you can see uh, we examine the uh, fiber. We take lots of pho documentary photographs and then we store them in uh, safe conditions that are um, humidity and um, temperature uh, controlled to make sure that the textiles are safe. And we have many, many different outreach activities. So we perform these activities at the museum, but also around the world and especially online. One of the ways we uh, do it at the museum is we curate exhibitions. This is an exhibition uh, that we did a few years ago called From Kente to Cuba. So we had pieces from all over Africa, um, stitched textiles from all over Africa. We have docents who give tours of all of our exhibitions and we welcome docents of all ages. We would love to have um, UNL students who would be interested in docenting as well. We go around the world giving talks and sharing our collection with people. This is a photograph uh, where I was able to give a talk at the first China International Quilt Academic Seminar in 
Shaoxing, China back in 2015, but we go all over to talk about our quilts. And then we also uh, are in many places online. You can find our website here at the bottom, internationalquiltmuseum.org. You can see so much about us there. You can learn about our current exhibitions. You can search our collections there. Just a lot of information. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, adding new videos all the time, um, including our first Friday fun, which is a, a segment that our education coordinator, Lauren Holt, puts together every month. Uh, we also are, are very active on social media, so go ahead and follow us. Our handle is just International Quilt Museum on Instagram and Facebook. And finally, uh, World Quilts at the top right there, worldquilts.quiltstudy.org, is where we um, curate in-depth looks at different topics. And we're, we're, we're always working on new modules. Uh, sorry, this is a little pixelated, but uh, the American story, the Central Asian story, the Amish story, the crazy quilt story, those are all modules that we produced over the last few years. And then we just added one this year called the 1971 story, which is looking at a group of quilts that um, were very influential and went on display in New York City in 1971. So that gives you, yeah, just an overview of who we are, uh, what we do. We would love to have you come over to East Campus and visit us. And at this point, if there are any questions, uh, I can take them and I would be happy to answer them. So thank you so much for joining me uh, for this year's International Education Week. <laughs>